Hare Krishna, Shamanandru. Hare Krishna. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Thank you for having me. Wonderful that we are back together today. So I thought we could discuss today on a spiritual or a Vedic perspective on this concept of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, uh, you know, I had read about this in my college days in an extracurricular class that I had heard. And it seemed very intriguing. Uh, but I believe that you have studied it as a part of your academic studies itself, isn't it? So maybe yeah, you- I think basically in every uh, commerce or management studies, whenever the issue of what motivates people, when that issue comes, Abraham Maslow's name comes up uh, at the very top of uh, those who have contributed to this thought. At the same time, we should be aware that uh, not everything what he said is now agreed. And uh, even in the material world, there are people who have uh, different thoughts about how those, how that hierarchy can be understood. So oh, okay. I would very much like to be the, uh, like the person from a commerce and economics background and uh, like to posit these questions before you and uh, you, your angle of uh, Gita and Bhagavad wisdom could uh, make a very interesting conversation. So shall we begin? Yes, please. All right. So for the benefit of those uh, among our audience who may not have had uh, any brush with Maslow due to them studying the hard sciences, mathematics, or uh, uh, other related subjects. This was uh, kind of uh, published in 1943. Uh, and in 1954, it became like a book which was published. Mm. And uh, this is the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, the theory of motivation, what motivates people to do um, what they do. I remember in one of our uh, classes called organizational behavior, one, he he was a reputed uh, uh, HR professional, uh, this is in our management college. And he said, so everything about organizational behavior can be summed up in one line. And we were all ears as to what could be that one line which defines all of organizational behavior. Why do people behave as they do? I still remember it was, it was 1988, but still I remember that line. And uh, of course, when I read the Gita and also some of the Bhagavatam concepts, you really understand this is why people behave as they do. So sometimes you feel that, you know, five, six years of studying macroeconomics, microeconomics, human behavior, cognitive psychology, and sometimes just one particular thing from the Gita and Bhagavad gives you a sense of satisfaction that, oh, this is how it all boils down to. So I had this kind of a moment with Maslow's theory. And uh, here we are today, uh, kind of rubbing it on the, do you know this uh, theory that gold can be tested by rubbing it on a stone? There is a Mm. specific stone with uh, the Zavedis or the dwellers. And uh, that one line it comes and they think it is a genuine, uh, it's genuine 24 karat gold or whatever. So your intellect is that stone. And uh, my contribution is the theory part of Maslow. And we will see whether whatever he says holds true. So Mm -hmm. to put it very, to put it very briefly, basic needs, psychological needs, and self-fulfillment needs. These were the thoughts which came in the mind of Maslow. So basic needs are physiological needs, what your body needs. Hmm. And body is exclusively the physical body. 
food, water, warmth, rest, and so on. Higher than that are the safety needs. You need security, you need safety, like there is the rest, which is a physiological need. But unless that rest has uh, an assurance of safety and security, hmm. you won't be able to sleep properly. Okay. Like, like uh, a very humorous example, if you're told that uh, you, you can take rest in this nicely air-conditioned room with a warm bed uh, or warm or cold, depending upon where you are in, part in, in the world. And by the way, there is a snake somewhere. <laughs> so, so obviously, your physiological needs are met, but not your safety needs. Mm. Then he said, he calls them the basic needs. Then we need belongingness and love. We need intimate relationships. We need friends, community. This is where the explosion in exploiting this particular need with social media, with chat rooms, with Insta groups, with Facebook pages, offering you this, at least claiming to offer this in plenty. Then there is esteem needs. Now we have... Uh, the last of the psychological needs, we need prestige, we need feeling of accomplishment with when we do something. And lastly was, uh, according to Maslow, self-actualization. This is the very word he coined. Achieving one's full potential, including creative activities. Mm. So, this was 1943, 1944, he kind of a little bit solidified them and then he kept on polishing his views. And later, uh, these are the salient points added. This is not an all or none kind of a scenario. It's not like if we don't get all, we don't we get nothing. Not like that. Also, he observed that it's not like when hundred percent physiological needs are met, then you only have safety needs. 100% safety needs are met, then you go for belongingness. No, they kind of, it runs through the whole scenario. And my last point now is, uh, one substantial addi addition was made to these uh, five groups. I would not say five needs, but five groups. There are cognitive needs, where you need knowledge and understanding, you're curious about the universe, you want to explore aesthetic needs. You want to appreciate beauty. You search for harmony, balance. And believe it or not, they are calling it transcendence needs. Values which transcend your personal self. And in 1943, Maslow's understanding was maybe 1% of American population. He only studied the best of the best. That means the best of the colleges, best of the business people. And he said maybe 1% of them are approaching self-actualization. So this is a summary of what he kind of discovered or postulated. So it's, you want to make a comment on this or before? Yeah, sure, question? sure. Yeah. The first thing is I just thought of how uh, we can have contemporary perspectives, not just on something which is like the Vedic texts, which are thousands of years old, but a contemporary perspective on something which is even a 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Like, I don't think when Maslow talked about belonging, he would have thought about social media yes. and seeking with likes and followers over there. So that's a contemporary expression of that. So that was quite striking what you mentioned. Now, when we talk about this hierarchy, it's a uh, broadly speaking, Mm, I had heard of this as hierarchy of needs and you prefer to phrase it as theory of motivations. It seems uh, that both words are used. So is there some difference or is it essentially the same? The hierarchy, of course, we can say it's a pyramid, so it's a hierarchy, but uh, need and motivation, uh, do they essentially convey the same thing or are there some subtle differences over there? Well, psychologists don't seem to agree on like a concrete definition of motivation. 
I think two, three days ago, you were saying that the word motivation seems to be like, what, what could be his sinister motivation? Like it is some kind of a negative connotation. And now we have people who proudly say, oh, I'm a motivational speaker. I, mm. I help people get motivated. So this, uh, my old professor, when he said that, oh, we are simply vexed by this question. Why do people behave as they do? Hmm. So that seems to be like the perennial quest for understanding how do we, I think in all fields, we have this uh, fixation with one particular question, like physics has this thing that can we explain the universe with just one equation, which can be worn on your t-shirt. I remember somewhere that this was the ambition that this one equation should satisfy. So maybe it is modern education, which kind of gives you that impetus for finding a one size fits all solution for everything. So in that way, uh, when Maslow said these are needs, later people said that no, it is not like somebody needs uh, these things in this strictly in this serial order. Also Maslow famously commented that man doesn't live on bread alone, but that happens only when he has bread. If he doesn't have it, okay. then that becomes his primary fixation. So he's basically so, doing a twist on that biblical. Yeah. Biblical so how thing. far it is true that for a student of bhakti wisdom or Vedic wisdom, that you need to have uh, these things met. And uh, another point which came up recently in one of our discussions was, it is futile to talk of religion to a man on empty stomach. Now you nicely reminded me that this doesn't seem to be a, like a Puranic quote or a quote from Mahabharata or Ramayana. And I also could not find out. But it is generally accepted that if a person is hungry, you you feed him. Mm. And, and then you try to fulfill his uh, other needs. So that seems to corroborate well with Maslow's observation. Would you like to discuss on this? That's a good point. So, two, three things. First is that I've always found that any system of classification of taxonomy that we may use, it is always an approximation of reality. Mm. Just like a map. You know, in, in a in a map, the boundaries seem very neatly drawn. This is India, this is Pakistan, this is China, this is Bangladesh. But in real life, you know, especially I heard the Bangladesh boundary, India's boundary is very messy. There are many parts of India inside Bangladesh and many parts of Bangladesh inside India. And then inside the parts of Bangladesh, which are inside India, there are parts of India again. <laughs> so, so, so then they had to resolve the issues and it took decades to resolve it eventually. So... Similarly, my, any system of classification we have, it's, a, it's like a map of reality and it's a tool, it's approximation. So we can consider at one level where the approximation helps or how much the approximation helps in help us in, in for navigating the territory and where the map doesn't work, where there could be, there could be the territory could be different from the map. So with that uh, caveat, I feel that, uh, see, although he talks about self-actualization, in my understanding that there is, he, from what I have heard of Maslow, he ne- never really had a clear understanding of what the self is. So uh, if a person is spiritually very nourished, spiritually very contented, then to some extent, the other needs become less important. So it's, and it, this is something I think is, is also ordinary experience. Sometimes some people become absorbed in doing some work. Maybe they're writing a book or they're doing some research or they're meeting some deadline in something and they forget to eat, they forget to sleep. And it's not like an austerity that they're consciously doing. They just forget it. So in one sense, it, it, it is possible that even from empirical observation, 
that sometimes a person whose higher needs are fulfilled in a uh, in a very meaningful joyful way for them their lower needs may become decreased their lower needs may become uh, uh, not exactly eliminated but substantially reduced or subordinated so now that if that can happen for something at a material level itself somebody can uh, had you mentioned me there some famous mathematician or someone when he was to do a surgery he said that don't give me anesthesia i'll just think of math sums in my head and he was able to get the surgery without any anesthesia and i had heard that even stalin yeah that's a story about stalin that he he was he not trust his physicians with anesthesia so he said i would rather tolerate the pain oh okay so that's also another example so it does seem that now in, now in one sense it could say that for him the if it was not lack of trust it was was it the security needs trumped the what is the first level first is basic physiological so, needs the security need, the safety need could trump the physiological needs mm. or we could say here in this case the it's i think it's it's not esteem or prestige so so it seems that if somebody is joyfully absorbed in something which they love so that self actualization needs could sometimes uh, override the physiological needs and i it, it might apply to everything not entirely ek like say we have examples of parents sometimes you know depriving themselves and starving uh to feed their children or even doing something something which is physically impossible say sometimes a parent sees that their child is trapped under a car and they just suddenly get power to lift the car and these are not just in movies it it's been documented in real life also not that every parent will be able to do it but it seems that in some occasions the high so the higher is not just in one sense attained after the lower but once the higher is attained the lower can become less uh less demanding it can consume less attention and it may require less uh less absorption so then we could take this extrapolation for extrapolate further and then we can understand how the goswami's nidra ahar vihar kaadi vijitav as said that so they they conquered food and sleep so uh, any thoughts on this yeah this is exactly what uh, i would like to kind of drive our discussion towards <clears throat> we have the prime example of the six goswamis in our gaudiya vaishnav sampradaya and specifically it is mentioned shinyas acharya mentions in his uh, stuti prayers glorifying them that nidra ahar vihar so basically he has negated three of the basic needs which of course may not be in need from their point of view and uh, at the same time these individuals are considered as the most productive and uh, most charitable and always working for the welfare of people in general and at the same time dhira dhira janapriyo from their point of view they are not distinguishing between somebody who who takes whatever help they are offering and somebody abhors it somebody is averse to it or somebody doesn't take it so this seems to be like a complete different angle of looking at um, human behavior beautifully put so now another thing is that okay going back to your earlier statement about whether a person can can seek the higher without having the lower fulfilled so again my understanding would be it will depend on person normally no but we have examples of say sometimes people who are on a search they may not have achieved a spiritual search but just they are passionately seeking a spiritual search somebody might be on an intellectual search somebody might go say say for example somebody goes uh, mountaineering they they want to climb the himalayas get to the mount everest then they may risk their life so in one sense for they want that 
it we could call it esteem or actualization and i want to have the distinction of having touched or uh, conquered mount everest and for that they may risk their life they may endure extreme discomfort so so that means that the lower needs can be subordinated for higher needs uh, for something higher but say there are people who are living in the himalayas and uh, and for them going to the mount everest is nothing exciting in one sense that's this common it may be difficult but it's nothing is very exciting for them so then for them if they don't have food properly if they don't have the proper uh, warmth and basic necessities they would be miserable and for them if they are there they are not seeking really uh, to go up the mountain they may help those who are going up the mountain so that they can have their basic needs fulfilled so could it be that then now this example that that the needs are also arising from one's uh, say conception of life or one's desires or, now in one sense what the difference between needs and motivations which i had we were i discussed earlier so generally we we often use the word between difference between need and greed so greed is something which is excessive disproportionate need is something which is essential and now if we consider desire do we associate desire with greed or need so sometimes we could say i we desire something that we need i am hungry i need food and i desire food but desire could also be associated with greed and roughly now i am putting a lot of terms over here but i'll come to my point that we could equate desire with motivation that what what motivates people what do people desire when they do some things like that so for most people unless something higher catches their fascination uh, because of some reasons some exceptional reasons the lower will need to be fulfilled before they can get to the higher so the so the desire needs to be addressed at a lower level before their desire can ascend to a higher level and uh, one way of correlating with this vedic tradition would be for most people dharma artha kama has to be addressed before they can move toward moksha any thoughts on this yeah this is a nice uh, kind of correlation with uh, the famous uh, four purusharthas purusha is a person male or female and artha is what do you desire so the vedas exhort that first of all try to find dharma that itself is a daunting task because dharma is called nihita guhaya which it's 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 elusive it is not easy to find you have to do a lot of introspection and also asking questions to the right people you have to find the right people and then that dharma will give rise to artha that artha will give rise to fulfillment of your desires and ultimately moksha so what what were exactly you exactly seeking to find whether the, the uh, so, so, so my point desire is, is greed desire is uh, now so the point i was making was that is it that desire could be we could equate desire, so let the a desire at a lower level usually needs to be satisfied before a person can go to a desire at a higher level that was the point i was making now okay. exceptional cases some a person's desire for something higher may be so strong that a lower desire may be neglected that was the see see this thing fits what i read in one paper was that a very accomplished person a very rich person or a very famous person but he is lost in the woods and that for a very long time so the reason the the fact that he is famous does it help him now the fact that he has money doesn't help him now he is hungry for the last two days so the only thing he wants is food okay now this is just a like a situation just to make us understand or uh, it could be an exception so even though you may have other needs met at a particular time 
that particular need could be the boss, could be the one. It could be urgent, and it could also be important. It may not be significant from your whole life's point of view. That oh, I was just uh, seeking a few pieces of bread or whatever, and you may pay exorbitant money also if somebody like we are just uh, arguing for the sake of uh, a discussion. That somebody comes and says that okay, two pieces of bread, twenty dollars each. You will gladly pay because that time you are hungry. Okay. But that doesn't mean that uh, bread is all the time very important for you in your life. It is just at that particular time. And if we bring in our uh, question of theology, that I'm talking of a very high level, certainly not my level at all. That uh, oh, I'm starving for the last two days. Maybe Krishna wants me to starve. That's all. If and we have our one of so many of our saints, almost all of them, show this kind of example that maybe this is the way God has put me in a situation, and I just need to cooperate with God's plan. I'm again repeating. This is not for the novice. Not for you. Don't need to. Kind of test your destiny with this kind of thing, but the like Shila Prabhupada also has uh, shown this kind of behavior that my all my money is gone, my chances of reaching here in Jhansi also are gone, and uh, he said I laughed. Now, being bereft of everything, surely laughing is the last thing in anybody's anybody's mind or anybody's thoughts. But that came because now this is what I would like to really say. This is a person who's already self-realized. That's that definition of self which Maslow could not find because mm. today, if you try to find what is this self, so here, uh, sorry to say that, but the understanding of self seems to be very puny and very. Kind of trivial that you know I am an actor, I am an astronaut, and uh, I am a published author. That means I am self-actualized. My I see myself as somebody doing this, and then I am self-actualized. So psychologists are saying that oh, you don't need to be a NASA astronaut to become self-actualized. You could be a primary school teacher in a small town. And if that is exactly what you want to be, then you are self-actualized. But the deep understanding of the self as a non-material spark of life, that part of life within us which is spiritual, that is our real self. That is the point where self-actualization, or as a Psychologists have added transcendence needs that comes in the picture. So, any thoughts on this? That's nicely put. Huh? I, I like this point of sometimes I talk about self-realization and uh, self-actualization. They are somewhat different, although the terms may be used as interchangeable. So, self-realization mm -hmm. is more of understanding who I really am mm? Mm -hmm. and so that is the part of this that is understanding that I am the soul and self-actualization is the other extreme where it is actualizing or making into re bringing into reality the making actual the potential of the mind body machine that we have so, for example, somebody is a somebody has a great musical talent, and if they have that musical talent, that's wonderful, and they can and should develop that talent. And if they develop that talent and they they become a great musician, they become a great sports player, whatever it is, that is wonderful. But that in itself doesn't make them make them self-realized. So they may have actualized their potential uh, at a physical level, at a physical level or at a social level. 
so this uh, so self actualization in that sense is a somewhat fragmented understanding so at one level the self is unchanged mm -hmm. so self realization it is understanding our spiritual essence what we eternally are mm -hmm. whereas self realization is manifesting our potential through our body mind machine it is becoming what we are capable of mm -hmm. and uh, this is we need a healthy understanding of when to focus on what so in some ways if you go see modern self help books and everything they focus primarily on self actualization they have no idea of what the self is but you have so much potential in this world you can become a, you can become this you can become that you can fulfill your dreams and there is a part of transforming or becoming within us which is important so so arjuna always had the talent to become a great archer and he became a great archer by his diligent practice and discipline but at the same time just becoming a great archer itself did not make him a devotee it did not help him to realize that he is a part of krishna so self realization is something different so in one sense a holistic self development is both there is self realization aspect and there is self actualization aspect and if we are too other worldly then we focus on self realization and then we may neglect self actualization so when he talks about actualization needs it is not so much of uh, he is using the self in a more metaphorical sense as something which you think which is very important that which is speaks to the deepest part of you that you should be able to do it so an artist may feel i want not, a writer may feel i want to do nothing other than write and that's that's wonderful but just by writing the right uh, the the person is not going to realize that i am a soul it can help detach them from other things so we could say that the high, high the motivational needs they are needs of something actually one says other than the self that they are needs of the body they are the needs of the mind they are the needs of the ego and then there is the soul's need also expressed through it but the soul's ultimate need is to just realize who we are not in terms of what our body and mind's nature is so quite often when they talk about self actualization it's more like uh, understanding your swabhav aligning with your swabhav and then becoming what you are meant to be according to your swabhav according to your psychophysical nature but the essence of the self is something different any thoughts on this yeah very nicely put uh, now i am very clear about uh, why you maintain this uh, distinction between uh, uh, self actualization and self realization and now now is now is very clear mm. so the point is like today see 1943 and now it is 2021 so almost 80 years after this theory has made its rounds uh there seems to be some kind of a well i'm putting it this way some kind of glee on the faces of modern psychologists that say oh he's not at all totally right so maslow doesn't have that kind of a uh, uh, following or some kind of uh, celebrity status but they say at least he laid laid the foundations of understanding hierarchy of needs or motivation or why do people behave as they do today they are putting more of a emphasis on happiness and this is a a, a very interesting subject that finland denmark basically finland and denmark they rank very high on the happiness index <clears throat> and bhutan as a country also ranks very high on the happiness index but if you see the the kind of mobile phones per 10000 population the the ratio of uh, tarred roads per 10000 population how many vehicles are owned per 100000 population bhutan has very low scores on that but why are they happy so basically it is like framing of the question that when you uh, like when you use your definition of self actualization like your mind body and uh, that full development oh i wanted to be a formula 1 race driver i wanted to be a model now today's 
young boys, many of them would like to be YouTube influencers or uh, Formula One race drivers or uh, film heroes. Girls would like to be models, YouTube influencers, social media experts. And if they become, they feel, according to Maslow, you give me a certificate saying, oh, you're, you're self-actualized. Self-actualized you could be according to this theory, but you could not be happy. So, so even if somebody gets, you actually somebody gets what they want, Maslow could give a certificate saying that according to me, you are the top 1% and you have nothing to gripe for, no excuses to make any kind of mistakes or, uh, no, not excuse to make mistakes, no excuse to, to grumble about anything. But that, that's where the theory falls on its face. That contentment and satisfaction and happiness that still eludes people. And uh, this is where we have the real understanding of the self as uh, distinct from your material body, your mind, and ego, a completely spiritual entity, a spark, which is what uh, uh, is famously used many times, that the, the, the self is like a spiritual spark. And uh, Bhakti Yoga wisdom is where you fan that spark and grow into a big fire. That is a metaphor for uh, growing your spiritual personality. And uh, then, whether you have friends or you may not have any friends, whether somebody is a recluse, a, a meditator just sitting alone in the forest, but there is no, there is no requirement for uh, any friends or any intimacy or any anything. So, uh, can we can we discuss a little bit more on the actual understanding of self according to Veda wisdom versus what psychologists call the self? Yes, it's. Uh, I think this could even be a separate podcast in itself. But in presently, the idea of the self, they say that the self is basically constructed. So their idea is that we have a social self based on our social identity. We may have a cultural self. We may have an emotional self. And uh, um, now the idea is that, so it's almost like self is equated with one's self-identity or self-identification. So cultural self means I may think that, you know, I'm a traditional Indian or a social self maybe thinking that okay i'm a i'm a belonging to a particular profession or a particular regional demographic group and whether underlying all these selves there is any real self that is something which is open to question and especially because buddhist thought of anattavad that buddha rejected uh, buddha rejected the idea of self or at least he is attributed that is a teaching attributed to him that he rejected the idea of a self from that point onward, what has happened is that the idea that many people today think that there is no such thing as a self. So the self is the notion of self is something which is a which is a illusion, which is a psychological illusion or like a neurological illusion. And uh, by the by the brain's functioning, we get the idea that there is a self. But this is, uh, for most people, this sounds completely irrational and acceptable. Because, you know, we do all function as if we have a self. So, I can talk about the problems with this theory of the idea that there is no self. But that's, but before I go to that, if you want to add something or respond to this, this idea of a self, you can tell, you can say something. No, you, you, you carry on. Okay, so the so the so one way to talk about it is that if the their idea of the self is constantly changing, you know, we we are constantly changing the impressions that shape who we are, and shape who we think we are. They're constantly changing. But so for, uh, so this is from a psychological perspective. But the point is that there is some substratum that is unchanging. 
otherwise if we throw a 50 story person from a 50 story building down is it that by the time that person crashes to the ground uh, that person has changed to somebody else and that person won't die somebody else will die no it is you who will die and that's why we are afraid of death uh, somebody might have a somebody might be 60 years old and their mother might be 85 years old and uh, she might say oh my little boy and she might have called him a little boy when he was 5 years old <laughs> now from 5 to 60 there is a big change but still there is something unchanging so the problem here is that uh, that you know one of the characteristics of the atma that the bhagavata says i think 224 25 is that uh, that it is not perceivable it is not even uh, what is that word uh vishwanath jagat ko explain it can be known only by shastra it cannot even be actually reliably inferred um uh, अचिंतोयमेंटेड contemplatable so avyakta in one sense we can say that it be refers to that it cannot be perceivable by the senses and achintya is 225 it is that it is not even perceivable by the mind so it can only be perceived by by scripture now of course we could say that we can make inferences about the ex- ex- existence of the self by of the self as soul by by logical analysis and it's possible but it's not a uh it's not a irrefutable analysis that will be acceptable for everyone so in that sense that is the problem that the we implicitly accept that there is a self but to get a clearer understanding of the self perception or inference alone may not help so we need some kind of uh, higher understanding means that that comes from scripture so just to complete this point normally in science we talk about empiricism and uh, rationalism so that is pratyaksha anuman but it's interesting that einstein himself says that how intuition is a far greater source of understanding than either experimentation or theorizing or reasoning mm. and in some ways in in religious traditions we have the conception of revelation so revelation is like a we could say a dramatic comprehensive uh, comprehensive uh, transmission of wisdom from a higher source to a particular living being but in another sense when a living being gets an intu- intuition or what we call as inspiration It's a sudden understanding. This is right. It's sudden clarity, sudden conviction, sudden resolution of complicated problems. So many of these people who, who many of the scientists and musicians who made these breakthroughs, many made significant breakthroughs. They say that it's almost as if we got the answer on our own, uh, not on our own. It's almost as if the answer came on its own, as yes. if planted inside us from somewhere else. You know, so, poets talk in terms of the poetry told me to write me. it is something like really that. okay <laughs> <laughs> there is a famous author i forget his name he says that you know how do how do you write your novel so he said you know i just follow the characters and note down whatever they do <laughs> that's my novel <laughs> yeah so so the idea that uh, something beyond us may reveal something to us so that is also required to some extent for self self realization for understanding the self so this whole dimension of the self it seems that it is missing in in uh, most western philosophy of self as atma self as a non material source of consciousness can i turn to another point yes please please so this thing of physiological needs food clothing shelter the closest which comes to alluding to this concept is शरीर यात्रा भी चाहते ना पसीदे तक करना इफ यू डोंट एक्ट वो अर्जुना हाउ वुड यू इन मेंटेन योर बॉडी सो 
Sharir Yatra. It's a very interesting uh, thing that uh, Krishna mentions it in this particular way. And uh, as far as the basic needs are concerned, like sometimes uh, students in India, especially, they ask that if we follow the Gita, would we have food to eat? So does it does it address at Maslow's basic theory of physio physiological uh, security? And uh, Prabhupada would say, of course. Why do you think Gita would say anything impractical? Do you agree that uh, living beings subsist on food grains? I would say yes. Food grains come from rains. Completely observable phenomenon. Nothing wrong with that. But when the rains are born from yagya, from sacrifice, you may say, come on. How come, you know, you just perform some fire sacrifice and rains come? He said, well, if the first two are common sense that you need to eat, you need grains to eat, Prabhupada said, you cannot eat nut bolts, you cannot eat PVC pipes, you cannot eat PCBs, you cannot eat chips, not the potato ones, the mm. integrate ones. So, <laughs> so you need grains and it is as, uh, like it is common sense, grains need to be grown and they grow by good rainfall. Good rainfall is a product of sacrifice. You have to find out which is the which is the how do you say recommended sacrifice for that particular time, and your bodily needs are met. So, uh, the Vedic wisdom is not saying that. Like this is another fear, or sometimes in uh, India people ask that, what if you negate all your basic needs and only concentrate on self actualization? Now, for some time. We will go with Maslow's term, although we we mm. know that we are talking of self-realization, or we can use self-realization also. What if somebody makes self-realization the only goal of his or her life? Will they be excused from having to worry about the basic needs? That's interesting. You know, one of the things which I have repeatedly come to realize is that sometimes one of the best ways that it's it's a it's considered a rhetorically shady strategy that it is to create false parallels or to create okay. false polarities so so uh, that means what are the false polarities that if you do this will you have this okay so for now yes theoretically speaking uh, we are not saying that people have to starve so that they they study the bhagavad gita or chant krishna's names and uh, as we know, Prabhupada also arranged for food for life and uh, that compassionate attitude was there, no doubt. But the point is that in how many people are in the situation where, how many people are in the situation where actually they have to be like that, that they have to, that they have a choice. You know, if I chant my rounds, you know, I will not be able to do my job. And therefore, I will not have food to eat. Okay. How many people are in that situation actually? So if somebody is in an emergency situation, yes, we, we society is meant to create resources so that people can have gainful employment and financial stability. And the individual also needs to take some responsibility for that. Uh, but in general, for most people, this is, uh, we could say, more of an excuse than a reason. Mm. for not, not exploring spirituality. So it says, it says India, people say, in India is so poor. Why does India, India needs to develop economically right now? Uh, why should it, India needs more of, say, humanitarian work, economical development, and these things, economic development. India doesn't need spirituality right now. So one response could be, okay, if that's what we need, is everybody doing that? Is everybody contributing to economic development of society in a, and doing some humanitarian work to help people who are underprivileged to develop economically? No, the people who say this quite often are engaged in all kinds of sensual pleasures, which may actually have very little to do they may, to with humanitarian work. They may be having their luxuries, they may be spending their time in enter, mundane entertainment. And I'm not saying this is bad. That's not the point over here. The point is that how many people actually do this? So, so that's one way of looking at it. Uh, any thoughts on this? 
Yeah, somebody, I think there was a group of chartered accountancy students, CA students, and they said, so is the goal of ISKCON to make everybody into a monk? Hmm. What would happen to the world if everybody becomes a monk? And uh, one of our senior teachers said that, okay, what if everybody in the world becomes a chartered accountant? So he said, oh, that's not possible. So why not possible? Well, somebody has to work for someone. So he says, similarly, don't worry that everybody is going to become a seven-headed monk and that's what our goal is. It was never our goal. It was never even, uh, it is not impractical also. It is, as you rightly said, it's simply an excuse for someone to not take spirituality seriously. Yeah, having said that, I am not a categorically saying that this is not important or this should not be done. That's not the point at all. Correct. Definitely, we, we agree to recognize the importance of certain things in certain situations. So, fully agree with that point. Maybe our importance of, uh, maybe our importance in giving importance to understanding Gita wisdom gives people the feeling that, oh, this, this will talk only of that. That means that is the only goal which they want all of us to have. Oh, okay. That's a good point. Not at all. We just want you to understand that. Uh, there, there could be this hierarchy of needs and uh, as we see uh, even the I just repeat even modern psychologists don't agree that this is a concrete line in stone kind of a hierarchy but that hierarchy or whatever categorization not a hierarchy even that is acknowledged by Vedas the Vedas recommend a lifestyle where all these needs are met and just like a novice student is given certain privileges and certain strictness, like from in primary school, you have to be at a particular time, you have to have your clothes, uh, you have to have your, like in our school, the shirt must be tucked in, shoes polished black, no long hair. But then at a PhD level, they don't expect somebody to come at a particular hour or there is some bit of a leeway in what your attire could be. Of course, I don't want this to be stretched. But because the student has shown that much of uh, merit, so certain uh, lower things are kind of neglected because the, the higher duty is expected. So this is what I am trying to say, that somebody who is already self-realized, you cannot expect these needs to show up in his life as a matter of hierarchy. Like somebody is mm -hmm. an excellent, okay. uh, somebody is fully fixed in the self and still complaining that, you know, okay, my, 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 my spiritual poetry is top notch, but, uh, you know, I haven't eaten for the last uh, 12 hours. We, we, don't, we don't see that kind of a, that kind of a complaint. Uh, we, we see that uh, when we read in the prayers that uh, basic needs like food, rest, they are they are not uh, repressed, but they are transcended. Is it, is it right to put it like that? Beautiful. I fully agree about this point of. So it's a. It's in no ways is it self deprivation. It is more of uh, the self having a higher level need fulfilled by which a lower level need becomes somewhat redundant, we could say. Now, yes. so just to integrate this, this point about uh, that for some people, the lower non-fulfillment of the lower needs can be an obstacle which needs to be removed so that they can uh, so that they can actually progress toward the fulfillment of the higher needs. But for most people, uh, it is, they will in their own routine lives create arrangements for fulfilling their normal needs, their basic needs, we could say. And uh, it is not necessarily automatically that one may progress toward higher needs. This is this is the interest, maybe you could comment on this point, that uh, so would a person automatically progress toward 
seeking spiritual fulfillment what we can call a self realization in one sense as human beings like once we have we have basic survival we look for safety then we safety we look for belonging we look for not just a sense of belonging but a sense of like respect i want to be accepted in social circle and i want to have my own space i want to be respected in social circle and then i want to make my own distinctive contribution so so you could say that accepting is belonging then respect being accepted is belonging respected is uh, is esteem and then in some ways manifesting my uniqueness my distinctiveness not necessarily egoistic sense but that's self actualization but so a person may progress upwards but uh, unless there is some impetus a person may not necessarily go higher and higher and may never go towards spiritual spiritual needs in the sense of self realization unless they get some good association unless they get some spiritual association any thoughts on this yeah so this is uh, primarily seen in the lives of a few prominent members of society who were not part of the counter culture um, ambarish ford like a scion of the ford dynasty then mm. marco ferrini who became matsyatar prabhu later one of the youngest billionaires in a town famous for uh, design especially in marble and wood and then george harrison and later a uh, bhakti tirth swami would talk about mohammad ali so like this is like two generations of uh, famous personalities rich famous and they seem to have everything what others could feel that okay only if i have that i'll be happy mm. this is something which people have that only if i reach that stage that hierarchy then i'll be happy and almost all these individuals at a particular time of point of time they ask the question what next and the universe could not give them any answer okay i have these millions i have fame i have youth like like uh, i think bhakti tirth swami talks in terms of mohammad ali telling him that i just need to pick up my phone and any of the female celebrities of whatever category whatever uh, field will gladly accept my invitation to spend some time with me or whatever but then comes the question what next so what next i feel as a connection with the hierarchy all my physical needs are met my emotional needs are met my esteem needs are met i have everything still why do i have the question what next that means there is something which is there it's hidden from me and as you said when they come in good association if they ask the proper questions then they are given the proper definition of what the self is and as the uh, bhagavatam describes a fish out of water syndrome put a fish uh, in a in a luxury bed with a, a fabulous home theater system surrounding him with the best of sounds and visual entertainment and the fish would just request what next just put me in water so self realization as defined in our uh, in vedic wisdom is if you ever find yourself asking the question what next after getting everything what the world has to offer obviously it means your real self has not been even understood or satisfied and as uh, the bhagavatam famously says yayatma suprasiddhati like satisfying the self fully or the gita talks of yat yatha yatra paramate chit paramato chittam uh, uh what is that yeah yatra paramate yatra paramate chitta yatha chaivatmana atmanam sukham pashyan atmani tushyati sukham so, atyant yeah sukham atyantikam yat tad indriya grahyam atindriyam yes so that is the stage of self realization which not only completely satisfy the self and even what people like imagine now 
having achieved that one comes to the realization there is nothing more to be achieved and funnily some people feel oh that's very bad that will put an end to all my activities if there is nothing else to be achieved then it will be bad for me so they would rather be perennially in search of satisfaction rather than get something which actually makes them satisfied for the fear that oh if once i'm satisfied then i'll be bored that i will be bored with the same doing the same thing but they don't understand that the spiritual self it is fresh it is new nitya nava navayamana mm always new always fresh and at the same time you are doing the same old thing again and again like you can say what do you get from chanting and propa's answer was very cryptic more chanting we say oh that means you are in a perennial sense of dissatisfaction is is that is the be all and end all of your spirituality not at all that's beautiful huh so i think there's verses which you quote about from the bhagavatam about from the bhagavata 6 chapter about self realization they are they are amazing and that's a very uh i think it's a very sweet note to sweet and spiritually and devotional note to conclude that that when the highest need is fulfilled then nothing else matters yes then for example the gopis are ready to go to hell to please krishna for just one moment to release krishna leave krishna's headache for one moment and that indicates that when that they don't really care for anything else at all so so we could say that in one sense we have to we have to at our stage we have to gradually take care of all the needs we have to in a balanced way take, take care of all the needs while at the same time making sure that we give due attention to the higher needs and then as the higher needs start getting uh, fulfilled more and more then our dependence on the lower needs may become lesser till eventually we may transcend them and those are the examples which we have we cannot artificially imitate them but they can be a source of inspiration for us rather than thinking that i this is not i am supposed to imitate them so imitation will be impossible and thinking that imitation is impossible we may consider we may actually harm ourselves or reject the whole thing as impractical but that higher experience can actually make uh, the lower uh, lower not exactly redundant but less insistent less important so that is the end of my notes here would you like to summarize actually we touched upon quite a wide spectrum of thoughts yes so true uh, so let's uh, see we discuss as i said a good amount of things i basically you introduce the concept of maslow's uh, theory of motivation and broadly the five levels physiological then uh, safety then love belonging then esteem and then actualization so in organization theory this is what makes people tick that's the understanding so now from a vedic perspective we understand that uh, there are people that we are ultimately spiritual beings but we are encased in physical bodies so the body mind machine also requires to be taken care of and then in that connection we discuss that there is this hierarchy rigid so is it always the way this way this is how it works so we discussed even in what to speak of spiritual life even material life if a person very concerned about something higher like stalin being concerned about his safety or uh, author or some author or creative person being inspired in a flow of creativity so even those needs may be lower needs may be subordinated or forgotten of uh, because of some absorption in higher things so any system of classification is like a map which is a tool a approximate tool for the territory it's never a precise replica of the territory so then so do does normally people have to fulfill the lower needs to get to the higher needs yes most people have to do and uh, you mentioned about how uh, when people if people's lower needs are not fulfilled can they not fulfill the higher needs well that might be possible but it's uh, it's rare the tension between the two is rare and society needs to be arranged so that people can be have their lower needs fulfilled and then they can go towards the higher needs 
but just think if 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 we is a people because my lower needs are not fulfilled so i won't go to our higher needs then what may happen is the lower needs may keep expanding expanding and then they will become desires that gravitate towards greed and people get diverted so they never rise to something higher so in principle a uh, human being has to live in a holistic way you talked about how people think that they are happy say people in bhutan may top in the happiness survey scandinavian countries is top in the happiness survey but this is more of a subjective conception and if you look at the overall way of living you now in some places maybe people are free from physical dependency on gadgets and comforts and still they are happy in another place they are heavily dependent on those things and then they think they are happy so we can't just rely on our subjective feelings if we want to object object we actually grow in our life and then it, i talked about this concept of this hierarchy of needs is good but even when is talking about self actualization there is no clear understanding of the self so self actualization is more of manifesting the potential of the mind and the body but there is self realization which, uh, which the gita and the vedic text talk about which is realizing who we essentially are and that if it is neglected then everything else may give some fulfillment but it won't produce anything enduring and <clears throat> later we talk about how also i mentioned we have talked about the dharma artha kama moksha yes the, in the vedic standard also it's understood that we fulfill the lower needs to go towards the higher needs but uh, the understanding is the higher also needs to be pursued and that pursuit may not happen automatically it has to be sought consciously and sometimes it's by the association of devotees who will by the association of devotees that one will be able to do that and uh, we talked about people who are super successful like george harrison and others as it, it is only when they found something higher that they got satisfied so unfortunately today's world the concept of self itself is rejected as a mental construct psychological construct but there is a self which needs to be realized uh, which is achyavyakta achintya but it is it can be realized through scriptural revelation it can be understood through personal intuition also and then lastly you talked about the samadhi verses where there is a supreme fulfillment where none of the material pleasures or the material distresses trouble a person because they have become so spiritually fulfilled and they can embrace troubles in fact they they can embrace deprivation of their lower needs for the sake of the higher fulfillment like the gopis of rindavan any points you want to add since in this podcast we talked about the self and you mentioned a very important point that the very idea of self is rejected when did the rejection actually become prominent or uh, the west never accepted the idea of the vedic self maybe that's what we could discuss in another podcast oh yes that would be a very fascinating topic to discuss thank you very much thank you for your association today Hare Krishna and look forward to it in the future again